Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palenker. These days, with streamers and cable and broadcast and print and podcasts, the entertainment universe is like one giant Amazon fulfillment center. <laughs> and Weezy and I go through there with a forklift and oh, yeah. pick out things that are worth your attention. Mm-hmm. Plus, the best part of our show, honestly, is getting to talk to people who are groundbreaking in their field, that are known and loved far and wide. And in today's case, they also happen to be a very close friend and former co-worker of mine for 30 years. She is a pioneer anchor lady on both local and national newscasts. She's an an author. She's had an astonishing life. She's the one and only Kelly Lang, and she's going to be with us in just a few minutes. Exciting. Weezy, what exciting. do you have for us? Fritz, I've read Spare by Prince Harry because I am a normal human American girl, <laughs> mildly obsessed with Great Britain's ruling class. And I think the Yanks especially identify with Harry because we too went to great pains and lengths to shake the yoke of British royalty. It's an <laughs> institution which entraps those born into it, enmeshed in a hierarchical dance of dominance they are cloistered from those they rule pitted against one another jockeying for standing and learning early that survival within the splendor and scrutiny often means stepping on a neck to save your own yes it's a life of service but at what cost to the soul harry's thesis is that the palace is locked in an unholy embrace with the press feeding them stories and lies that harm another in an effort to improve one's own public standing. Now, you, like me, may have friends who say, oh, boo-hoo, Harry, cry into your crown, take the carriage for a lope around the gardens and have your (laughs) footman fetch you a toddy and pudding. But Harry, as we all know, lost his mother at the age of 12 to an accident incited by the very press who are now hounding his wife in all new lows of monstrously racist and dangerously shameful proportions. As the torment persisted, Harry's royal family offered him no comfort, no guidance, and no assistance. This book is not a leak to the press credited to palace sources. It's Harry telling his own story in his own often funny and very poignant words. Spare is Harry's tea meets harbor moment. His efforts to free and protect his family are valorous. Monarchies are not safe for children and other things. Bravo, Harry. That's exactly the way I feel. <clears throat> I haven't read the book, but I saw the Netflix series, and I am firmly in Harry's camp. The amount of guts it took for him to blow off his whole root system and uh, protect his family and have premonitions about repeating what uh, happened to his mother happening with his wife, I give him a lot of credit. I can't believe how polarized people are about this. People the, have strong opinions. They really do. Let's see if Kelly can wait. Do you have an opinion about the royal family? Well, I think Harry's terrific and Megan. I'm very proud of both of them. Good for you. That's exactly the way I feel. That's how we feel. All right, let me give my offering. I want to do All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a feature film on Netflix. It's a remake of a film from 1930 and a slightly different treatment of a novel. Now, it's a war film, but it's an anti-war film. A German teenager, Paul Baumann, and his friends get caught up in the nationalistic fervor in Germany three years into World War I. With a combination of testosterone and youthful ideals, he and his friends enlist in the German army. And as the film goes along, we see the idealism begin to disappear and the realization that there really isn't a lot of heroism in actual battle. And your main mission is just to stay alive. Now, there's a parallel thread that follows the Germans trying to negotiate peace with the French and the Allies leading up to an armistice, and this, which was not in the book, but it was really, from a historical standpoint, really interesting. It's a German production directed by Edward Berger. The German viewpoint makes it ironic because what happened to Germany in World War I ultimately led to the resentment and hatred, which led to the rise of Hitler in World War II. So it's a great piece of history. It's a commentary on the bloody realities of war. Also, it looks at the danger of virulent nationalism. Sound familiar? Beautifully shot, dark, realistic, and often disturbing battle scenes. Great German actors. A really interesting commentary on war. I loved it. I thought it was great. It's it's hard to watch, but it's real and honest, and the acting was spectacular. I'm so happy to be able to introduce my very close friend. There's nobody I love more than this lady. We worked together at NBC4 Los Angeles for 30 years. She was the first 
female NBC news anchor in any market in the United States. She's been a helicopter traffic reporter, a weather caster, a news anchor, a host of the Rose Parade, a co-host of the Sunday Show, which was a seminal local show produced at NBC4. She co-hosted the Kelly and Gale Show with her best friend, Gail Parent, who was a writer and producer on Golden Girls and the Carol Burnett Show, and created Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, a groundbreaking TV show. The two ladies were hysterical together. We'll talk about that. In her most recent chapter of her life, she's an author of five books. Pick one out and read all the interesting notes that you'll see on the screen in front of you. We call her the queen of news, Kelly Lang. Oh, I'm exhausted just hearing you (laughs) say all that. That was a lot. I'm so happy to have you here to talk. I hope we have enough tape in this machine to record (laughs) your interesting life. Uh, I'm going to start where we need to start with your career. Who is Dawn O'Day? Oh, my God. Dawn O'Day was when I first got here from Boston, um, I I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be a teacher because I had teacher's credentials from Massachusetts, which in California don't do you a whole lot of good, as you probably know. So um, I saw in the LA Times that KABC Radio was looking for what they called a ladybird. Ladybird was in the White House at the time. It was, oh. you know, Right around the year one, it was, it was very early. Clever. And um, so I thought, wow, they're looking for a ladybird. I had no idea what that was. So I went down there uh, to where they said they will be meeting. And this was in the valley um, on Riverside Drive where there's a shopping mall. <laughs> and there was a trailer and it said KABC Radio. And I stood in a long line of women. And when it was my turn to get into the trailer... They put a headset on my ears and pinned a number on me, and they said, when you hear the voice in your ear say, begin, then read this, and they handed me a sheet of paper like that, and I looked at it, and I heard him say, begin, and I read this, and this was a very boring uh, traffic report on the freeway, you know, and um, so I, I read it, and then when I got finished, I said, um, you know what, now that I know what this is about, I could do a better job. So can I do it again? And the lady who was running this contest said, no, everybody gets one turn. So, you know, no. She said, next, and threw me out of the trailer. And she must have seen that gleam in my eye, Louise, because she said, and you, pointing at me, she said, don't you try going to one of our other locations, because that's <laughs> also against the rules. So thank you. I waited about three weeks, a reasonable time, and I changed my, instead of wearing pants, I wore a skirt, and I put all my hair up under a hat, and I I changed the location. I went to Downey, Buena Park, down by Downey, and um, changed my name to Kelly Lang, because my boyfriend at the time was Jim Lang, who did the dating game. Any of you old people will remember all of us back in the dating game, but anyway, and... um, so I went as Kelly Lang. My my name was Kelly Snyder, which never would have worked later with Tom Snyder. So, but it worked out. Well, fine. it kind of would have worked. And I wrote my <laughs> own copy. You know, I wrote a very funny. I thought it was funny. A sheet of and and then on my way driving down to Buena Park, I memorized it, so that when I got there, same thing, a shopping mall with the same trailer, big long line of women. When I got in, same woman, and you know, being a, a Catholic. My heart was, I was thought I was going to get caught cheating. Um, and same thing, the headset. My, and uh, when you hear begin, uh, say your name and you know begin. So I said my phony name, Kelly Lang. And uh, I said, you know, do you mind if I do this in my own words? I might be more comfortable. She said, I don't care what you do. <laughs> so I did. And I was terrific. I said, good morning. Los Angeles, this is Kelly Lang. It turns out that of the thousands, like something like 56,000 women entered this contest in, um, God, this is a long story, isn't it? In um, traffic, in uh, shopping malls in the coverage area, which is from um, Santa Barbara to the Mexican border. So 56,000 women and nobody said anything else except what was on the paper. So, of course, I was going to win, and I did. Wow. And they so, called me. They decided to call me Dawn O'Day. They gave me that name. I know. It sounds like a stripper, right? Because you were on in the morning, and the yeah. evening girl was called what? Eve O'Day. Yeah. Yeah. And so, she dressed in a silver LeMay jumpsuit. It was I very mean, Jetsons. It just shows you that the women were considered a novelty. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, not, absolutely. Not anything serious, just something, a distraction or, you know, something to look at oh, yeah. that was interesting rather than someone that was actually capable of doing providing, something. Yes. Yeah. Providing and today we'll go, we'll go out to dinner together and we won't know where we are. And Kelly says, I have no damn idea where I am. And I was a traffic reporter. I didn't know where I was. Never. I was when I was doing well, the I had just either. got there from Boston and I didn't know, you know, I looked down and what I'd see is, um, you know, uh, somebody's swimming pool. I didn't know L.A. No, I never do. Still don't know. <laughs> it was very funny. Yeah, didn't need to. Well, now we have uh, my GPS is is dressed in uh, gold lame. You can get the Dawn O'Day app, and it will take you in gold lame wherever you need to go. Oh, good. I still have the suit. Do you have the suit? Oh, sure, and I still fit. Well, let me, is I it? I should have brought it. <laughs> Yeah. Is it available for rental for costume it, it's, parties? Um, it's skin tight, stretch lame. And do you remember, does anybody remember um, the Playtex living girdles? <laughs> You're not that old. I don't think she's old. The girdle lived and the woman died. That was what yeah, they didn't like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And well, this was a living girdle all over your entire body. You couldn't breathe. You couldn't think. You couldn't talk. You couldn't walk. And you had to wear that? Yeah. Well, because the station hired the helicopter and put me up in it every day, and they would give prizes to people, which would give you a ride around the L.A. Basin with oh, Dawn O'Day, and okay. give you a donut and a cup of coffee, and that, you know. Okay, because I was thinking, it's radio, can't you just get yourself comfortable? No. All right. All right. No, it didn't happen. That wasn't, like, as you said, Louise, it was a gimmick, a, a novelty. But you were always tenacious, and when you got your news job as well, you did not go the route of everyone else that was auditioning. You always kind of were crafting some sort of way to give yourself an edge, more preparation, more opportunity. Well, yeah. Well, the way I got that job is I cheated, too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one time I, I was kidding. I said I cheated my way to the top. And L.A. Times had a some columnist put that and she cheated clawed her way and she, well anyway i don't think it's cheating i just think no, it's, it's, it's thinking a, out of the box it's a way it's like a workaround it's it's how we solve problems yeah so go ahead and well tell because that. there were no women right at the time doing television news and everybody told me and in fact i mentioned that my boyfriend at the time was jim lang and he uh, besides doing the dating game uh he also was a radio disc jockey a morning disc jockey and he said honey don't bother with this. They already have who they picked out, and I didn't listen. And I, I still went to every callback, and I did get that job. And the way I got the news job was um, somebody told me that KNBC, our channel, was looking for a weather girl. They had Gordon Weir, who was a guy and a meteorologist and had done it forever. And um, so uh, I called them. And she said, oh, that's terrific. She said, we hear you on the radio, the girl, who, lady who answered the phone. She said, yes, you're Don O'Day. I told her that. And she said, terrific. And I said, great, when do I start? And she said, no, no, you'll have to come in and audition with other women. And uh, so I showed up for the audition, and there were they were all models and these actresses and great-looking women and me, right? So uh, I thought, wow. Again, they were looking for something else. You know, uh, but that's all right. You were gorgeous. What are you talking oh, about? Please. Why are you separating you yourself? You told me. You know what he told me, Louise, the other day. He said, "I never thought of myself as good looking." I said, "Fritz Coleman. Every woman in L.A. wants to get fixed up with you, and half that's of right. them call me." That's right. Yeah, that's just irresponsible. And, and he's the puffery. only one who doesn't know how good looking he that is. That line outside of uh, <laughs> yeah, that line outside of the all mall. All women to uh, audition yeah it's now to date fritz it is you oh, yeah. go down there and you uh you line up outside of the fashion square and that uh, you read copy and then fritz might take you out on may a or may not yeah right. and when any woman always said you know can you fix me up with fritz coleman they know how close we are and i say mm, no i'm not finished with him yet <laughs> and he's very grateful so you went on to have a weather career and you mm -hmm. and i had parallel paths because neither you nor i know a damn thing no. about weather no. And we had a career doing it. Well, it yeah. worked for traffic. It worked for traffic. Yeah, it worked, yeah. And, and How also, many years did you do we, the weather? We worked hard, too, didn't we? Oh, no, we did long we hours. We the, the weather service every morning and find out what it's doing. And as you have said, well, you know, they could go look out the window. <laughs> right. But. Mm. Yeah. How many years did you do the weather? Um, I think four or five. And yeah. then how did you transition to being an anchor? Um, and you were the first 
in the NBC chain, and they owned and operated stations, the first female anchor in the NBC family. Oh, yeah, NBC there were family. no women. And they all told me that. No, women, we don't have women do this. It's not. A, it's just like, Louise, where could we get, you know, well, she, you're much younger, but they didn't want women doing anything. We could be a secretary. Uh, we could be uh, a telephone operator or something like that, you know? Do you think, though, that it's, they considered it to be too distracting? People will be distracted because a woman is saying things? Or do they think that, do men think that, like, I get to walk into parties and be like, hey, you know, I do this manly thing. And as soon as women can do it as well, it's not such, you know, it's not and such. And then they realized what they're realizing now, which is people watch if you have an attractive woman doing anything on TV. You can watch with the sound turned down and a rock modern off music playing in the background. And they don't care because people watch. They're beautiful people and people like to watch attractive people on TV. Well, who knew the answer to your question, Louise? But even the guys and just Marlowe turned out to be a dear friend of mine. Even Jess, Tom Snyder, none of the guys wanted me there. And it took me a couple of years to get to the point where anybody had any respect for me mm-hmm. as as a broadcaster. And you're wondering, is that because they want to have locker room talk or because they're going to be attracted to you and that will make it hard to concentrate? Like what what is what is the resistance? I guess there's a lot of factors, right? Just new, I don't know. I mean, new. it was a guy's domain. Maybe you no. know. You're a guy. No, I don't know. I, I <laughs> uh, but but uh, I I think it was a guy's domain. It was changed. There's inertia. It's the, the old boys network. Mm-hmm. And but then you work your way in and you survived as many as have had to survive, which is just on the strength and the warmth of your personality. And people love to watch you. God bless you, you silver-tongued devil, no, my brother. No, it's true. It's, it's absolutely true. And you came up a, as an anchor in an era when personalities were huge. I mean, you had Tom Snyder. You had Tom Brokaw. You had Bryant Gumbel. You was had, our sports guy, Bryant Gumbel. You had yeah. Ross Porter. I mean, these are some of the biggest names And Pat Sajak was our weather and Pat guy. Sajak. And Keith mm-hmm. Morrison. Oh, Keith, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's pretty dreamy. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I didn't get along with him, so we're not going to talk about well, it. Well, no. Dish, okay, so when, how did how and why did he get on your nerves? And we love him, but like, I'm how sure. Did, how and why did what? Did Keith get on your nerves? Oh, I'm not going into that. Come oh. on, Louise. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll Google it. So she, I want to know about live TV because there's just not a lot that people do anymore that's so, that's so live. And other than sports... Usually you can say pick up and do and do the read again. But like you guys were doing live TV every day. I want to hear some horror stories. Well, how about I felt I'm the only person I know who fell asleep on the air. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was not good. Um, I was going with my soon to be husband at the time who was Billy Friedkin, the exorcist, uh, the French Connection director. Right. So I was working all day and so was he and we were up all night and I was tired. So. David Horowitz, rest in peace. God bless David Horowitz. Um, he came on the set, and he, it was before prompters, and he had a big, uh, he, he, it was a long thing he was going to read this time. And, um, and it was about uh, how the electric company was ripping us off. And what we should do is we should put a pad of paper and a pencil by every T- uh, light switch and write down when we put it on and write down when we put it off and when the, wow. when the bill comes at it was so boring that you know I, <laughs> I fell asleep I, you know and I, um, I get it I almost yeah, fought, I'm fell like asleep this, while you, t- and you told the, it the first thing that the next thing I knew was um, Horowitz fin- he always he was like this you know he'd put his hands on the and he'd say and so fight back Kelly <laughs> and the camera shot came to me and I'm <laughs> <laughs> So and that tape got out of the station and to the whole circuit in the country before we were off the air because it was funny, oh. you know. And they didn't fire me. You know, they could have fired me for so many reasons over those thirty-five years, and they never did. This was always amazed me. Well, I mean, I think that when you have warm relationships with folks, that's not the the go-to position. But if you're looking for a reason. To get rid of someone who... You'll it, find it. Right. Then the one infraction, and like, this person has to go, and now they can put it in your file, and here's the reason. Oh, yeah. But like, we had great people, bosses back then, too, who are less prone who to Who got do that. the joke. Yeah, we had Tom yeah. Capra was our news director. You know, Frank Capra's son was oh, our boss. He was oh, so wow. much fun. Yeah. yeah. He was a very funny man. Well, I want to know who wasn't fun that you're willing to talk about. <laughs> Fritz? 
<laughs> you have a different perspective. Who's willing? Because... You or me? I'm not. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's like any situation. There are people you're going to be crazy about, and there are people... By the way, I heard Fred Rogan is retiring on Thursday. Thursday at 5 o'clock. That's his He's last a terrific show. broadcaster. Wow. And... Um, <laughs> See, you won't go there. Neither will I. No, I understand. You have. We have friends who listen to podcasts, so we don't want to. Uh, very, hurt, very hurt good broadcaster. I, I mean, there were some wacky people. We had. A, I mm-hmm. mentioned his name. We had an on-air doctor who has uh, gone outside the legal limitations in the United States on several levels. We won't talk about him. <laughs> but there was some law breaking. Bruce I Hansel. Mean, <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, yeah, it, it rhymes with that. <laughs> but that's, but there were some law breaking people. There were some people that were, you know, that are maybe in prison currently. I, I mean, there's a lot that went yeah. on within those walls over the years. And that's oh, yeah. why it was more fun. Well, you know, I always say Fritz and I were in the foxhole together. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was fun. It was really fun. It was, it was really fun. And I think you, when it was you and Snyder, oh, Tommy. and then John Beard. Brokaw had already gone to the Today Show. I think those were the housing and days of local news. I do too. And because after that, the importance of the local anchor has sort of dissipated over time. And now there are a million stations and everybody's news, doing news at the same time. You can't even identify who you're watching. So I think you were there. I think you're right. Yeah. And Tom Snyder was a visionary. He was incredible. He was my best friend over there. Oh. And he told me, Kelly, this is the best it's ever going to be. And we're having it now, so enjoy it. And he knew. Somehow he knew. Some, that's prescient because yeah. that was a wave that you were riding. And I rode a similar wave in radio where you couldn't have Premier Radio today launching because everyone's attention is so scattered, right? Yeah. But back then, people were watching one or two or three things, and you were one of them. Another thing about doing the news at NBC during the time period that you did it was that you were neighbors with Johnny Carson and Jay Leno. And so all kinds of fascinating mm-hmm. uh, movie stars and uh, heads of state. It was incredible. And and I've mentioned before, um, if I had come up in any other city, like Long Bony Fingers, Nebraska or somewhere else, <laughs> it would have been different. Mm-hmm. Here in the heart of Hollywood, really. Mm -hmm. And Jay Leno, I had the parking spot next to Jay's. He brought a different car in every night. He had one car that he had to, um, the headlights were gas lights. And he had to, with his lighter, he had to light the gas lights, the Mm -hmm. headlights. And it was fun. And we'd go down and they'd always grab one of us to go and interview whoever was on The Tonight Show, you know. One time, um, Jim Lang was on the Tonight Show, and they sent me down. Of course, he and I had this very early, but it was just a good time. Talk about Orson Welles, Kill. Ooh, Orson Welles. <laughs> Orson. One time, um, I was on the new. I was doing the news, and um, Bryant Gumble was doing sports, and um, a guy came dri- into the set driving a golf cart, and he said to uh, the producer, he said, Orson Welles. Is um, wants to meet Kelly Lang. He's on the Johnny Carson so he's show. He's on the Johnny Carson show right now. And we were doing the shows at the same time. And we'd like Kelly to come come over and shake his hand. And um, Erin Safchik was my, our news director. And he said, no, she's working. She's on the air. She can't come. So he went away. And then um, in a little bit, he came back. And he said, please, Johnny is begging. And uh, so Erwin said, okay, you can go during sports. But you have to be back in your seat when sports is finished. And that was like four minutes, right? So um, I introduced Brian Gumbel. I said, blah, blah, blah. Big trade in Dodger Town today. Here's the sports. Here's Brian. And then I jumped in the golf cart, ran up there, and I didn't have any time. I knew I had to be back. Uh, when, and um, so I, I jumped onto the set. They grabbed me, and they pulled me up to shake hands with Orson Welles. Live let, on the let show. Me, let me, Live on the Tonight Show. Let me tell the setup to this. Okay. Oh. Johnny was having a conversation with Orson Welles, and, you know, he's one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And Johnny said to Orson, well, who is the one person you'd love to meet that you've never met? And he thought about it, and he said, Kelly Lang. 
I know. So, they, so that's when the whole thing happened. It Wait, happened if, spontaneously. And on I the didn't air. even know and that until was, I watched the show that night. And if it was that tone of voice, then I'm worried about her. <laughs> like, was she was she okay? Oh, Did, yeah. No, no. That, we became sort of friends. I saw Orson a lot after that. You know, we'd go grab lunch or something. And, uh, yeah, well, it was so much fun being there at that time. Oh, yeah. It was really it, loose. Mm. And then the world started getting crazy. There was terrorism. We used to be able, when Johnny was on the show, and you were over there, too, because you had friends on the show, you could go backstage and watch The Tonight Show from backstage while the while the guests were being staged. And oh, I went sure. back there, and I'm having a beer with Clint Eastwood one time and, and Gene Hackman, and all these people are just standing around waiting to go on, and you could walk back there. Oh, yeah. And then things got weird, and there was stalking and all that, and they stopped doing mm-hmm. that. But it was really interesting. So I want to mention some people that you worked with, and I'll say their name, and just give me your fondest memory or an interesting memory. Uh-oh. Tom Ooh. Brokaw. Tom is terrific. Tom is really a wonderful guy, and w- we've always been friends. Um, what's to say about him? He did his homework. He was not like Tom Snyder. Tom Snyder never did his homework, but he always was such a good broadcaster that he was riveting. Right. Brokaw worked very hard, and he was a political genius, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and then when I did the, the Today Show, he was the, uh, the co-host, you know. So I've always thought very highly of Tom. Who couldn't, you know? Who wouldn't? Yeah, wonderful, he's a wonderful guy. guy. Bryant Gumbel. Bryant. <laughs> oh my, look at that look in your eye, Fritz no, Dorman. I, I want you to be, whatever you're comfortable in saying. Go Bryant right was the best broadcaster I have ever seen the first time he ever went on the air. I was doing the show and they brought him in from some uh, print he was doing. He had never been on television. His very first time on television, he was brilliant. He was a great, great broadcaster. Um, I don't know. Then if there's a but, right? Yeah, what? I didn't know. If you, you're the one that told me this story. Uh oh. But sometimes, one, one time you were on with him, and the teleprompter broke, or there, there was, there, he was missing the copy for the sports, and he brilliantly ad libbed four minute sports cast flawlessly. Great syntax, all the right words, and he, he was brilliant. He, he was a brilliant guy. He had no. like a photographic, and memory. he still is. You know, and Steve Friedman picked him to co-host the Today Show back in the day. And who would ever pick, you know, I mean, they said, well, come on, he's a black guy. He's a a local sportscaster. And he was brilliant on that show for all those years. Yeah. Your close friend, Tom Snyder. Tom Snyder, I could go on forever. Uh, (laughs) Tom was great fun. And he was so, he had a photogenic mind. He had one of those minds, he never forgot anything you know, and he had these eyes and he could stare right into the camera and everybody, you know how we're taught to uh, to feel that we're talking to one person, not a crowd, and Tom could do that and everybody thought he was talking to them and funny, I remember one time there was a bomb scare in the building and um, he came running down to my office and he grabbed me and this was just before the six o'clock news was to go on so we're all killing ourselves you know, doing our pieces for the show. And Tom said, there's a bomb scare. We're getting out of here. Come on. And he grabbed me by the arm and, and took me. And we went into the elevator and went downstairs and stood outside the building. Nobody else came out. They were putting the show on. And Tom and I were looking up. And Tom, I swear to God, he was hoping that the building would blow up because we were the only ones that went out, you know, show how smart we were. But anyway, he was fun and funny. Things we did on the... Um, we did a show called Sunday for years, and and um, he, he, like one time, he didn't want to do something. He didn't want to interview somebody, and this was a show that was live in different locations all over our coverage area. Again, it was like from a Santa network Barbara. Talk show. It was really sophisticated. Yeah, ninety minutes from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border, and uh, we went everywhere. And um, one time, he didn't want to do an interview about something. I don't know what. And he climbed a tree, and he sat up in the tree, and he wouldn't do the interview. And and we had a producer who was damned he was going to do that interview. And so she had, you know, we've got Thomas shooting us here. She had, um, she had the cameraman shooting him up in the tree, you know. Wow. And another time, Tom Way and I— before Michael Jackson ever pulled back. <laughs> no. No, another time. Go ahead. He did? Uh, well, in a, in a documentary, he's in a tree. He was in a tree. Okay. So yeah. Tom was in a tree. Another so. time we were in a park um, in a, a big 
park. I can't remember whether it was Griffith Park. So I think it was, was Griffith Park. Big, big park. And um, we were live, of course. And we had um, the a guy, a great um, Italian director, Franco Zifarelli, was our guest. And Frank Franklin Zifarelli was sitting here, and um, Tom was here, and I was on the other side of him. And he set it up. Tom always set it up. He said, no, oh, we have. We can introduce. You know, we're very pleased and honored to have, you know, Mr. Franco Zifarelli in his new movie, his brother, son, sister, Moon. And uh, he asked the first question. And then I went in. To, then I asked a question. And I, I'm looking, and I can see Tom where you're sitting, Louise. And he eased off the chair. We sat in high back chairs. And he let himself down to the ground. <laughs> the camera is on Mr. Zifarelli. <laughs> And he start running through the park, you know, and he had on a red sweater. And I thought, where the hell is he going? And I watched him and he ran. And so I kept asking questions of Mr. Zifarelli and it went on and on. And, and my producer was out there going, mm, mm, stretch, right? <laughs> uh, because nobody has mentioned that Tom has left the building. <laughs> and, um, and I got to where I was asking, well, in Italy, you know, they shred the mail. Why is that, sir? You know, like... <laughs> And finally, I see Tom running back, the sweaters coming, red sweaters coming back uh, in between trees and trailers and what have you. And he pulls him up on the chair and he turns to Mr. Zifarelli and he says, that was fascinating, sir. Thank you so much. Go see his movie, Brother Moon, Sister Son. And, um, you know, we'll take a break. And, the, and, he, and we go to commercial. And I said to Tom, I said, what the, mm, you know? And he said... I had a pee, Cal. I mean, we were a live show, you know? And he found Tom Bradley's trailer to go and do his business. Wow. Yeah, because everybody turned out when we were doing the Today Show, the, um, the Sunday show somewhere, everybody turned out because it was a lot of fun. Tell but the story about Tom. Paul Moyer, but, and, and this is not awful. I'm warning you ahead of time. <laughs> I don't, but but, uh, but uh, uh, about, you were interviewing one of the great, authors of all time and his wife had written a book yeah do, do, am i am i helping your memory you're helping yeah but of course my mind you know my mind is going my body's so, still good so but, so anyway yeah. you were interviewing his wife who had written a laura book. Hus huxley yes and aldous huxley was her husband aldous was her one husband. of the most celebrated writers of all time oh, tell, tell yes. that story well um again um moyer sitting over here we have laura huxley in the middle and then there's me and um we were cel we were doing the opening of uh, the Museum of Art on Wilshire Boulevard. It was the opening day of that. That's the kind of show. We went to everywhere where something was happening, mm -hmm. and she had this book she had just written. And Moyer never read the book, okay? He read the flyleaf, and it said that she helped her husband on such and such a book. And so we're doing the questions, and Moyer said to her, well... And your husband wrote a book, too. <laughs> and my job was, when he would say things like that, I just start laughing so that everybody would get it like it was a joke. And I went, ah. And Laura Huxley said, oh, yes, he wrote 43 books. <laughs> well, we're, and we're live, you know. Yeah. You can't. Well, one time I'm working with Fritz uh, at NBC on something that never happened. But I'm walking down that long, you know, that long corridor. Oh, sure. And, uh, and, Paul, and Paul Moyer is walking towards me. He looks directly at me and says, I just met Hootie. So, <laughs> you know, you don't want to say, you know, his name is Darius. You're just like, hey, he's excited. I'm excited. Good for you. But that to he's me was- He's an interesting was, dude. That said it all. He worked with people <laughs> for 25 him, years. Did you not catch his name? We worked with a woman for 25 years who was one of Kelly and my favorites, Lori, who was the makeup artist. Oh, yeah. And he worked with her for 20 years. And never knew her name. Okay, that tracks. Yeah, see what I'm saying? Crazy. Oh boy! So I, I, I would imagine that one of the scariest moments in the life of an anchor person would be the day when you get the call to do a cut-in, a national cut-in, or a national newscast, and you had never anchored the national news before. And you, and, and how does that work? So, if somebody calls you up and said, "We want you to fill in and do the." Well, you know, I mean, I filled in on the Today Show. I was Jane Pauley's regular fill-in. 
I filled in on the Tomorrow Show. I was Tom Snyder's when he moved the show to New York. Of course, I was Tom's Mm -hmm. fill-in. I mean, I don't know. I just was always doing it. And then I filled in for Jessica Savage, who did the weekend Mm -hmm. nightly news. Mm -hmm. So when she was away, or then they would fly me to New York. And first class, thank you very much, NBC, you know. So I don't remember ever... You know what was it like? Was it scary or anything? It's just what, what we but did. But it's just live TV, it's and just I always job. A, a it's all, it's all I've ever done is live TV. You know, that's mm-hmm. all we ever do, did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I can't remember. I mean, in that job for all those years, I mean, there were times when I was a little nervous or anxious or uh, whatever. I was never bored. Oh no! Oh no! Doing the Today Show that was like a, that was uh, like flying first class in the broadcast airline. They would bring you back there, and I it was in my contract for two weeks a year to fill in for Al Roker. Yeah, when he was yeah. on vacation, mm-hmm. and they would put you up at the Essex Park South, which is in South um, uh, uh, Central Park. Mm-hmm. They would pick you up at four o'clock in the morning in a limousine. Four a.m. Yeah, you would walk into the today's show and they would ask for your coat because as you were preparing your presentation they would steam your coat steam all the wrinkles out of your coat oh, yeah. and then you'd go in and the meteorologist who had been up all night preparing the weather told you what you were going to say it was unbelievable it was so much it fun. was a great job um and the very first time they would pick and it was hard for us to get up at uh 2 30 or 3 mm-hmm. because we worked late nights all the time you know mm-hmm. and so we weren't you, early morning people you are now Mm -hmm. i never have been but uh the first time the limousine picks you up in front of the hotel and i went down got in the limo and i'm half asleep and guy sitting next to me is willard scott the weather guy oh yeah funny guy Mm -hmm. and um i said hi i'm kelly and he said yeah yeah i'm willard he said hold this and he gave me a box Oh, I and I put the, I took the box and I put the box on my lap and the limousine took off to go to uh, 30 Rock. And um, we hit a bump or something and the box fell off my lap. Uh-oh. And Willard said, be careful with that. That's my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was always something. He was a lovely man. And you, oh, yeah. you, you emceed the Seattle Rose Parade with Willard, mm-hmm. right? And uh, what happened? Tempe, Arizona, oh, Rose Tempe, Parade. Arizona. Seattle Rose Parade with somebody else. I did everybody's Rose Parade because I was the Rose Parade chick. The, you, know? you did the, the national one for NBC yeah. with mm-hmm. Michael Landon. Oh, they were all national. Yeah. Michael Landon. Michael, Michael Landon. What a guy. How was Michael Landon? Talk about Wonderful him. guy. Wonderful. Fun. Funny. So handsome. Oh, he was great. Yeah. And we did that for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember he and I stayed, you know, friends for a long time after that. And one night he was on... The Tonight Show, and I let I went down onto the the uh, into the makeup room where he was getting makeup, and it shocked me. He was yellow; his skin was yellow, and um, I said, and he was preparing for a new sh- NBC show, and um, and I said, oh my God, Michael, are you okay? And he said, no, not really. He said, no, I've got this cancer, and I said. But this new show, he said, yeah, if I don't make it, then it's going to be NBC's biggest mistake since baseball. <laughs> I mean, he always was fun and funny, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe that was Highway to Heaven. He was just mm-hmm. going to start because he had Little House in the... Or what was the one he did? What, what is... Highway... He, he was Touched by an Angel or... I get all those mixed yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I all think it was Little House. Was it Little House? Yeah. Uh, little Michael, House on the Prairie. Michael, yeah, Little House on the Prairie. And then Highway to Heaven. Mm-hmm. Highway to Heaven. Oh, you Very cry talented. every episode. You just cry. Okay, so Kelly's on her way up to Seattle to do their Rose Parade. The Rose it's parade like a dinner there, theater yeah. Rose oh. Parade compared to ours. Mm-hmm. And what happened on your way up in the airplane? Um, Mount St. Helens blew up. Whoa. And the whole airplane, all the, it was during the day, you know, everything got black outside. Wow. And they had to make an emergency. We couldn't land in Seattle. We had to go to Canada because it was so widespread. And so we did. We went to Canada. We didn't know what was going on. It was Mount St. Helens. Spent the night in Canada. And then the next day, I was bussed back into Seattle to do the show. Yeah. But never a dull, right, Fritzy? Great, great experiences. Mm. Always exciting. And we survived. (laughs) Right? Oh, I don't know. Now, you were on, and this is on YouTube, folks, if you want to. Oh, look at Thomas. He's found Mount St. Helens. And I can see your plane. There you guys are. Thomas. You're making a quick left. (laughs) Oh. Uh, you, you uh, this is that? on YouTube, you were on What's My Line. Oh, yes. Yes. Early and on. That was my very first time on television because that was when I was on radio. Right. And mm-hmm. so I guess they figured out, they're always looking for interesting folks. Mm-hmm. And they figured out. Oh, you had to be- guess what they did for a living. There right. There we Oh, good job, oh, Thomas. My first time on television. Oh, my. Now, were you, 
Now, you're very composed. I've watched this. Were you nervous or were you just trying to accurately answer their questions but not give too much information? Oh, I was probably a nervous wreck, but you don't show it, Louise. You know mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Fritz knows that. You know, I'm terrified right now. <laughs> right. You know, I look at these things and, and it, you know, it's amazing anybody, uh, any like a person of color or a lower middle class person watched this because this was some snooty ass Upper West Side oh, people. Yeah. They had Arlene Francis and Dorothy Kilgallen. Oh, yes. And, and, Br- and Bennett Cerf and people Bennett in Surf the South Central are going, who the hell is Bennett Cerf? Mm-hmm. Yes. He was, yeah. a, he was a publisher, right? He was Bennett Cerf. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And who the hell was Arlene Francis? She was oh. somebody's wife. She was she, stage well, she, a stage actor. Well, oh, okay. Jim knows. Jim knows. Yeah. Well, we need a microphone for Jim. Well, we want Jim to have a microphone. Yeah, Jim a microphone. Right but yeah, it was always, even if it was Orson Bean or somebody, it was always that somebody was smarter than you. Yeah, right. And that's what oh, we yeah. liked about it. We weren't intimidated by people who were smarter than us. We were like, as a child, I was like, why not have the smartest people sitting here making me feel like I'll never be smart enough to ask an right. intelligent question? You look so... Beautiful, Kelly. There oh, was... God bless you, you silver tongue devil. And, and, and so Kelly's getting ready to leave after her triumphant performance. And what did Arlene Francis say to you? Oh, she said, what a great outfit. Because we were wearing hot pants back then. You were too young. Yeah, <clears throat> hot pants. And uh, I, well, that's what she said. Well, she said it was a beautiful dress. And you said it's she not said a dress. She said it's a great outfit. It's hot and pants. I just, and you walked out. Well, I pulled Ooh. it out to show her that it was pants. I don't Aww. know if you see that on there, I think. Maybe. <clears throat> yeah, maybe at the end, but they. But tell us what happens because I don't want to give it away. But what? Oh happen- well, they were, had to guess that I was a traffic reporter, and they never did because they, there weren't no women doing it. No, they. Oh, no, here's where. Yeah, shaking hands. Thank you. She was adorable. Uh-huh. They had no and frame the, of reference. Is that Barbara Feldon? Barbara Feldon, right? Okay. And we were. Yeah, they had no frame of reference, so they were and they were asking questions that that sounded mildly sexual because they were saying, "Do you move in a certain type of way <laughs> right. when you perform this task?" Like no one could conceive of a female doing right. a thing they with said, her they mind. They even said, "Did you do you take your clothes off? Any yeah. of your clothes?" <laughs> I said, "No." You know, the questions were so the, sexist. It, they were they were based on that current mindset she must be looking like this and being this age she must be some a model a or dancer. yeah doing something girl something something arousing burlesque and, burlesque. So, and so you burlesque, lean over yeah. and say to mr daly uh well because you were in a helicopter which was moving in an right. interesting fashion and you i think you were asking him like do i say yes or no because you have to give yes or no the person gets mm-hmm. so many questions and if they get a no it goes to the next person right yeah, I think so. It's a long time ago. This was, you know, in the, the 20s, I think. What's my what year escape? was it? I don't know. Uh, 67. 67, wow. So mm. you have... I have so much respect for you because you and our good friend John Beard... Oh, John. ...have great relations with your exes, which I've always oh, yeah. respected. Mm-hmm. There's no acrimony. And you were married to what I think is one of the most... Uh, Brilliant directors of, Brilliant. of all William time. William Friedkin. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's a fascinating story about how how he almost missed the opportunity to do The Exorcist after William Peter Blatter, Blatty, Blatter, William Peter Blatter, no, that's my urologist, uh, William <laughs> Peter Blatty gave him the manuscript and he sort of, talk about that. Oh my goodness. That, that is uh, such a obscure story. Um, no, but it's interesting. Though. He... <laughs> You Would mean you the rather, one where he threw it on the t- back of the yeah, toilet? Yeah, he said, no, this isn't going to go anywhere. You're well, a- he had just won for the French Connection. He'd won a Best Picture Academy Award. Right. Everybody was giving him scripts and, and books and uh, projects and suggestions. And so, yeah, he and um, The Exorcist was a big bestseller. Mm-hmm. And so Bill Blatty, who became a very, very dear friend of his and mine, um, he sent him the book, The Exorcist, and Billy just threw it on the back of the toilet. <laughs> oh, please. Yeah, and uh, he said one day he just picked it up and started reading it. He said, oh, wow, I got to do this movie, and he did. I mean, but, but Billy, Billy really pushed the envelope in yes, films with, uh, you know, frightening things and dark things and real, oh, yeah. you know, the lower side of human nature. But he was also very funny and a very entertaining man. Hilarious and wonderful guy. Brilliant. And you should get him on this podcast sometime. He, oh, that you, would be he unbelievable. Will, he'll have a good time. Yeah. And then he can tell those 
uh, bathroom stories about me, I suppose. But <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway. So I want to hear about uh, competition. You know, we talked about palace intrigue with Prince Harry. Was there any kind of like newsroom intrigue where uh, people were jockeying for more airtime or, you know, better makeup or lighting or, you know, what have you? Because you guys were sort of in the trenches night after night after night together. Did Was everyone supportive or was there? Mm. <laughs> Kirsty Wilde and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Skigate. Yeah, oh, you want God. me to tell the story or are you You, you okay tell it. Me? I don't oh. even want So, you know, we, we had, uh, Kelly was the main anchor. We had an overzealous sub main anchor. And um, Kirsty Wild, Kirsty Wild, right? <laughs> anyway, um, we were on this wave of doing big investigative reports. We're going to uncover them, find the truth. So uh, she got word that uh, people from the media, in particular NBC uh, anchor people, were skiing at uh, local ski areas gratis. Mm-hmm. They were getting their equipment and gold mine, yep. yeah. You know? And you know, it the, was a fun thing that he did every fun, year yeah. to have. All the anchors and all the news you know, people and now, get in a ski race. Mm-hmm. These days, they probably wouldn't allow you to do it because there's so much human resources crap. But any, back in those days, everybody did it. There, there was nothing nefarious about it at all. It was but, fun. Kirstie, but Kirstie Wilde said, I think we've got a real situation here where people are taking advantage and getting free things uh, and they're newscasters and they're supposed to stay objective and not do anything untoward like that so she decided to do an investigative report about kelly getting a free ski trip so oh. it's like it was a circular firing squad oh she goodness. was doing an investigative oh report and trying to drive down and, and that was obviously personal jealousy and her. capra and and God, Warbeck, the boss her. said Oh God! You got to fill out this thing. You got to tell me what you took. And I said, "Well, what did I take?" I said, "Well, we had. They gave us a hamburger," <laughs> and he said, "And French fries." And he said, "Did you eat the French fries, Kelly?" <laughs> I said, really? "Of course not." It was horrible. <laughs> well, it yeah. was all a joke. We knew it. And you know, she finally got uh, escorted out the door. But um, well, Kelly, Kelly, uh, Kelly Lan- or I mean, uh, Colleen Williams, who is still the anchor at Channel Four, worked with Paul Moyer, and there was a real. Uh, I, a, a real electrical friction between them and they would get so competitive that they would have their spouses time the number of stories and length of the stories that each person had on the air and if one was in arrears of the other they would complain about it to the mm. newscast he had a 35 second reader that i didn't have really? what the hell's going on here? yeah i never did that we no, never did that no, uh-uh. no we were just glad to go do the job, go home and get the paycheck, you know? It was always very nice. Right. And get a good table at a restaurant and all the great perks that went with it. Yeah, and get to meet Marlon Brando and... or Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando used to call me up. Yeah, he called up Fritz, too. Mm -hmm. He called you, too? Yeah. Did you go out with him, too? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, so what happened? Well, he would call me and say he wanted a a story on the air, and it was always about an Indian, some Indian story, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, remember Sally Lynch, our, our um, yes. secretary, and she would say on the loudspeaker, Kelly Lang, Marlon Brando on the phone, and everybody would pick up the phone. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that's yeah, the Mar- thing is, like, every celebrity is watching you. You, you know, you're aware of that, right? They knew us, yeah, because yeah. we were their broadcasters. Right. That's why I said if I, if I was in, or, and you, if we were in any other city in this country, we wouldn't have had the uh, opportunities that we fell into really a, cu- a, a couple of stories like that <clears throat> betty davis god rest her soul used to call and want to talk to john beard really? and, and john would never talk to her she was a little older and a little frail but she would always call her is john beard this is betty davis and, and, and john oh, was afraid know that. He yeah and here's another great story about that being in the you sometimes forget you're in the second largest market in the world mm. and you're in hollywood land out here yeah. we were in our, our favorite boss that we worked for john Rohrbeck, rest his soul uh who was just a vision visionary broadcaster guy used to take us to La Serre, which is mm-hmm. at the corner of Coldwater and Ventura in the San Fernando Valley. Mm-hmm. And we're in there, and Rohrbeck's favorite table was the gazebo. Did you did you ever eat oh, there? Oh, sure, with every yeah, time. The gazebo. Yeah. There are only four tables. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the gazebo. And so we're in there one night, and my chair, because I guess I was lowest in seniority, was facing the wall. <laughs> And so um, I got the good suddenly <laughs> I'm looking at it, it was Beard and Kevin O'Connell and, and John Rohrbeck and I'm watching the look on their faces. I'm looking at the wall and all the blood drained from all their faces and they're going, <gasps> 
and then I hear this voice. Well, look, it's my Channel 4 buddies. I feel like your family. And standing right in back of me was Jimmy Stewart no. saying that he was a big viewer of Channel 4. And you, you forget that those people are home watching you. It was mind-blowing. Wow. Yeah, it was great. Well, you know, telling the story about Kirstie Wilde and the ski gate. and she ski was, and gate. He took me to lunch at Le Serre. And he was being very, well, I have to, you know, tell me what else you had. You had a hamburger. And I, it was so ridiculous. I said, you're being ridiculous, John. And I started to cry. There's little tears going down. And in the door at La Serre walks Joan Collins. Wow. And she walks into the gazebo and she walks our, at our table. And she looks at me and she said, she says, Kelly, hi. And I said, hello, Joan. <laughs> you know? was, yeah. But that was the kind of life we led. And you're talking about, was there um, any uh, any com- competitiveness? Mm-hmm. John Beard, whom we love, you and John and so I. So sweet. Were, Best friends. Were, we were three amigos mm-hmm. over there. Mm-hmm. And um, John and I anchored together for 13 years. Oh, wow. And we had, during that time, only one fight. Okay. We had one argument. Yeah. And... Um, they were setting up a whole new set. And usually they told you where to stand, where to sit and all this. At that point, they just said, okay, you guys sit down on the new set. And we both wanted one chair because for some reason, John Beard and I both thought that was the power chair, mm. which is ridiculous, of course. They were two chairs like you and me are sitting in. Yeah. And um, we argued over the chair. Uh. And Beard told that story for years after. And he says, but he said, now it doesn't matter. Moyer's in it, <laughs> right? Ah, so who got custody of Fritz? <laughs> oh, I have custody of Fritz. Always. But you know what? No, we all, we both do. Because did you does Louise know about our our thread and our Zoom meetings? It was Fritz no. and John Beard and I all during the pandemic. Really? And Mark Thompson. Oh, he's yeah, so and great. We just kept up on everything, and it was it got us through the pandemic. Really? Did you do your own little mini newscasts? Yeah, well, we just talked to each other. We and, talked and about it. We, it was we, we gossip, were all really. of like political mind, and it would be great. Mm-hmm. We thought this would make a great podcast. So you and your best friend, Gail Parent, who yes. was the head writer and producer on uh, Golden Girls, mm-hmm. also wrote on The Carol Burnett Show, as mm-hmm. did your fantastic significant other, Jim Evering, and we're going to bring him in you here. You should in interview the- Jim, Kelly. Okay. Go ahead, ask Jim. Okay, wait. I just oh. ran, yeah. yeah. Well, he's, he's ready to go. Just let me ask you this question, and then we'll yeah. do it. But... Um, She's so funny. And when you two are together, you are so funny. And somebody was forward thinking enough to give you your own show called The Kelly and Gail Show. That was John Morbeck, yeah. Yeah, talk about that show. I think every diva needs a best friend named Gail. (laughs) Well, Gail and I, and she wanted to call the show Making It. And I said, no, 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 no. We're going to call it Kelly and Gail because then they can't fire, you know. I got it. I got it, yeah. So we did that show and it was a morning show and it went on. Uh, it was live. It went on right after the Today Show, so 9 o'clock. And so we had to be there at 7. And um, all day long, I was up doing three news shows upstairs in the news in the news set. Mm-hmm. And she was writing Golden Girls at the time. Oh, my gosh. So she had to go over to Golden Girls. And very often, we never got home from the, from the news until, you know, midnight, 12, 1, 2, 3 in the morning. And she never got home from Golden Girls till that time. And we would talk to each other on the phone because we did a live skit every morning and we wrote it on the phone at like two three in the morning <laughs> oh my god and we just make we never had time to practice it because it was the next morning and um we'd write it together and then memorize it and then go to sleep and be on the set at 7 a.m so we got maybe two or three hours sleep a night Ugh. and didn't we all during those days we never got any sleep i could stand against a wall and close my eyes and take a nap mm-hmm. you know back in those days but I, you know you look at the sunday show you look at kelly and gail there was a period of time up until about 15 years ago when local did some great local programming mm-hmm. i had my show after saturday night live oh yes it's fritz that had bigger ratings than the 11 o'clock news no. it was great they don't do that anymore they don't spend that kind of money no but uh, anyway i want to bring in your significant other and i'm so happy to say my, my so yeah uh jim evering who is a talented comedy writer he wrote on the carol burnett show he wrote on mama's family he wrote i think you did some specials for uh dolly parton am i yeah, right dolly yeah dolly and, and carol and he wrote right major dad and punky brewster oh, and yeah. all these shows back yeah. in the day a lot of, a lot yeah. of shows and yeah. we met in church jim and i no wow. can we move the ca- one of the ago. slide one of the cameras oh. Just to get Jim. Yeah, there we go. 
we'll cut in a really attractive younger man when it's time. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay, yeah, get anyway. somebody, somebody really you handsome got a, in there. Really but I'll tell you, thing. some of the fun times I have is when we're having dinner with Gail and Rob, and then Kelly and, and Jim, and they talk about you know the, all the webbing I'm working on these shows and the anecdotes are just unbelievable well That's I want really to know cool. if you have like a, a newsworthy probing question for Jim tell all go ahead interview Jim me? yes yeah. just ask you Jim you want me to ask yes. my honey I yes, met him please. in church oh okay and um, well I, he can tell the story I had not been with a guy for mm-hmm. 10 years and his he had been married for 35 years and his wife passed away he had not been with in a romantic situation for 10 years either so neither of us were looking so, we were, so all we were desperate <laughs> <laughs> no we, we didn't care just like fritz right now you know he's not in a relationship and and is not and out the there it's a better place looking you know <laughs> and um and so i kind of had chemistry with jim and um tell jim well, we went. We we did this. We we came from church. We went to the church together. Mm-hmm. Then we and I and I thought and I'd known Kelly just to say hello and stuff like that. And and I thought you know she's fun. She's fun. We went to Jerry's Deli after church, and we weren't hungry, so we decided to eat off the children's menu, <laughs> which was also <laughs> right the senior. It was the, the same. It, menu. it was the senior menu yeah. too. Without the so, so it was the senior and an adult menu. So we're carrying on about this, and we're laughing and and going crazy. And she wants to have a, a, an egg. They give you one want, egg. Yes, they give you one egg. But does it come they, with? They only give you one egg because yeah, you know you're, it, and it takes crayons. all that okay. time for your digestion to mm-hmm. work. And uh, but she had to have it poached, and the girls, we don't poach. The but, one egg. But uh, <laughs> we give Kelly, gets, Kelly gets what she wants. So she got a poached egg. And we're carrying on about the, the breakfast and just going nuts. And afterwards, uh, we're leaving there. And I t- said to my friend, to Karen, I said, I think she's hot for me. <laughs> and Aww. she said, no, come on, come on. So She said then, she always acts like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I said, no, no, there's something happening here. So then we went to some, uh, we went to a peach, peace march out in the valley, and it's like 110 degrees, and we're going from church to church. And we did, we did about one of those, and you couldn't hear anything that was going on. And I said, what are we doing here? It's hot. So we got on. We, we had saw a, a bus. There, yeah, there was a bus there. And the door was open. So I said, I'm getting on that bus. Yes. <laughs> so we got on the bus. <laughs> And from there on, we went out that night. We went over to her friend Gail's. You know, and they said, we, they said yeah. well, honey, he said, we don't, where's the bus going? We don't know where this bus is going. And I said, I don't give a damn. Don't I just can't walk anymore. We, were, we, were, per- we, were, yeah. we had had it I with think the it's a march. metaphor. You got on a bus mm-hmm. with Kelly and, and off you right. go. That's right. What Six was it like to write on the Carol Burnett show? Jim? Yeah, we want to hear well, about Carol. Because we, we're well, obsessed. Carol is a fan- fantastic person. She's the most amazing person because she knows the name of every person on the show, every crew member of the show. She would, I would say something to her about, you know, some some little incident, and then the next year you'd come back, and she'd and she'd bring up that incident, you know. So you really felt like you're an important person You're around hard. her yeah. she's so because she's so smart she is so well, she's she harder easy want, to write for she said i want to have fun she said you know i'm gonna have fun whatever i do once um well i won't tell that story I guess. um <laughs> yeah no there was uh, the person on the show was giving a giving her a lot of trouble and uh, you know he was not happy, and so she just took him in the in the dressing room and said, "You know, if you're not happy here, uh, you know we'd be glad to have you go. If you know if you want to, you know you want to go somewhere." He said, "No, no, no, I love it here." She says, "Oh well, I was under the impression that you were not happy here." Great so, diplomacy. So so it was just always a pleasure to be all the, with those people. Tell so, who it was. He was very famous. Yes, well, that's my point. Of course, I can't remember his name. 
No. It was either Tim Conway or Harvey Corman. It was hard. It was I think I, I was thinking Harvey, it was Harvey just because Corman. of Harvey's personality. So yes, but he Harvey got in his own head a lot. So that's. But yeah. you know what? One time, here's a great story <laughs> that involved Jim. They were in, Jim was an actor before he became a comedy yeah, writer. So they too. were doing a skit, and Harvey Corman was supposed to be kissing a woman. And he slipped. Tell, honey. I was well. I was the minister at their, it was their wedding, and they were supposed to kiss each other. And instead, he kissed me. So afterwards, he said, "You're a great kisser." <laughs> wow. He said, "Your lips are so." I said, "Well, I was. I'm an actor, so I was not expecting you to kiss me. So naturally, my <laughs> lips were not." So I was, I was being, I was being method. I said, "Oh, I said I like that. I like that. <laughs> that is adorable." Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, before we run out of time, I want to talk about the 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 great successful last uh, episode of Kelly's life. And that is being oh an author. Oh my goodness! Oh, are we oh. are we there? Oh, oh my god! Oh, oh, yeah. The great I mean. last episode she was, of her no, life. I, is she this was always it? Last is a <laughs> word. Always <laughs> a lot of fun. Most, god bless her. Most recent episode in, is what I meant most to say. Current. I, I, I chose the wrong word, but you're just a successful <laughs> author. And if you look at the uh, catalog of uh, literature, you pick a book: Graveyard Shift, The Reporter. I think uh, Trophy Wife was the first one, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And if you read my books, uh, you will learn nothing. I write mysteries. It's mind candy, and they're just fun. But you do a lot of research. I mean, for some of these murder things, well, you go down to the coroner's office and the police detective. Oh, yeah, detective. well, you have to. Yeah. You've, got to call, you've got to call the police department and say, how do you handle this? And how do you, you, learn, you know, learn how to do you know, blood spatters and, and all that. But they're fun. In fact, the one uh, in the middle... Uh, is the Hollywood Walk of Fame, um, the reporter, it's got blood all over it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a mess. Someone's going to have to it's clean It's the only that. Hollywood mm-hmm. book I've written, yeah. But it's so much fun. And I used to get, we used to get home so late. You know, after the 11 o'clock news, we'd go upstairs and not you, you did the weather and you were out the door. But uh, I was there and Wendy Harris, our producer, we would have a little meeting to talk about what went wrong with the show because the meeting was always longer than the show, you know? Sure, of course. And then we'd talk about this and that and assignments for the next day and then Wendy would break out the wine and would have a little wine and uh, we never got home till, you know, two, three in the morning. You were a night writer though, right? That's when I wrote because nobody was there, the phone wasn't ringing and yeah, and, and I used to come home and read I Love Mysteries the who, what, why, why, I love mysteries, and I would read until I finally got sleepy when the light was coming in the windows and the book would fall on the floor and I'd go to sleep. And then one night I said, I have read so many of these damn mysteries, I bet I could write one. And that's when I started writing. And, and that that talent brought you in contact with some really gifted writers. One of your close friends was Sue Grafton. Oh, my best, yes, yeah, she was one of my best friends, Sue yeah. And Michael Conley, you know from... Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, we all would show up at the same, you know, events, events yeah. right? Book signings and uh, what have you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do do mystery writers tend to write a part of what they know, but mostly like, oh, it's like, it's like if all my friends were murdered, but it's, it, you know, it's based on my friends, but then something grisly or ghastly happens, right? Well, Louise, I think... Uh, we all write autobiographically, yeah. and obviously, uh, the first two I wrote. Uh, the first one was in the garment district in L.A. downtown L.A. The second one was in the art world. The third one was in the newsroom. And then my editor said, "We're going to do all of them in the newsroom now because you really know the newsroom." Well, yeah, <laughs> you know. And so then, yeah. And Maxie Poole, who is my sleuth, she's a news anchor, and she's me. Exactly, except mm-hmm. she's taller, thinner, younger, sexier, and blonder, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you Max. named a character after my dog in one of your books. Oh, no, Mac. I put your dog. Mm-hmm. Your dog was in one of my books, right, yeah, right. Max. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because one time Fritz and I were out to dinner after the show, or between shows, or between the 6 and the 11, yeah, and we went back, and he had to pick something up, and Max, his dog, had chewed up everything. 
His his entire house, the couches were all chewed he up. He chewed up my brand new leather furniture and it cost me $10,000 to repair oh it. Oh my oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He, he was pissed off <laughs> so that you were gone, was, I guess. It was, it, was a, it, was a, yeah. it was a couch murder. <laughs> yeah, he, made a, he was taking, making a statement. Yeah. So Max was in one of my books. Yeah, I forget which one, but. What about Fritz? Is he in your books at all? No. no hell no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. There's nothing mysterious about but Fritz. But I asked Tom Snyder, if, did you, do you mind if I put you in one of my books? And right? he said, yeah, I do mind. He said, I'm very private. I do mind. I, well, he know he's direct. If he needs to pee, he just goes. Oh, he was direct, all right. Say what you want uh, to prepare herself to be a reporter on the China Syndrome. You led around Jane Fonda. Oh, yes. what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Douglas was producing it, and he called me and asked me. I knew him because, you know, Kirk Douglas was a dear friend of mine, and I took Kirk Douglas to one of Fritz's shows. Remember that? Oh, there's a Kirk picture of Kirk and Ann came in a limousine. We all went to see Fritz, yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I, 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 I'm, what were we talking about? Talking about the, uh, Jane, Jane Fonda, Fonda learning yeah. how to be a reporter. Right, so Michael called me, Michael Douglas, and said, could you uh, teach Jane you know, how to be an anchor. I said, sure. So she came and she followed us for a week, followed me. And I lit up the whole set for her and sat her in the chair and let her read off the prompter and get used to it. And I even took her down to um, a shop to buy her some corkies, which were the high heeled flat, sh- flat bottom shoes that I always wore to run around and still be tall mm-hmm. and thin and not fall down, mm-hmm. you know. And she bought the shoes, but yeah. She was with me for a week. What now? Fritz is looking at me know. saying, go on, go on. No, I'm no, not no, going no. to do that. No, I, I'm, I'm she glad you're not going to do that. She was not easy. No, and plus she's still uh, alive. So, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> so not easy. And by the way, have you seen her lately? She looks fabulous. She's gorgeous. She's in that new 80, 80 at uh, the Super Bowl. We want to see that one. Uh, 80. Uh, what's, it, what's it called? And that's a, it's based on a true story. Tom... Tom uh, 80 for Brady. 80, Brady. Yeah. 80, 80 for Brady. We've got to see if the four ladies are in it. Oh. Now, let me ask you this. Writing yes, news sir. copy yes, sir. Is, is simple spoken English. It's like mm-hmm. five or six words. It's a noun. It's a verb. It's you know, no adjectives, right? So did, did covering news stories and learning to write quickly stories that involve crime, did that make you a better mystery writer? Oh, sure. I'm sure it did. I'm sure that everything builds upon everything else, you know, and you stand on the shoulders of who you used to be. Yeah, because <laughs> I wrote every word shoulders. I ever said. I rewrote it. I love that. And put it in my own words. Yeah. I mean, I and I think that's something important for young people to understand is that life comes in chapters. Yes. And everything we do is informed by everything we've done. So never feel like you're you're stuck or you know you're not moving forward because whatever you're doing now is teaching you what you need to know for whatever you're about to do. So dig in and do do your best. And I love the the Kelly Lang principle of. Being inventive, being creative, and and being plucky, and 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 always thinking of a solution or what would give you an advantage, and it's and one of your other principles is just work your ass off because there's oh. really no shortcut no. for that, is there? You will no, never meet work. another human being with more guts than this woman. It's so fun to be around them because if things aren't going your way, she will reorchestrate things so they go your way. You She's so to. good. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like if there's no sugar at your table, she'll, oh, be, she'll find no, a table no, that has table sugar <laughs> and she'll go over there and get the sugar. God damn it. Uh, right. Yeah. No. But that but it, it is we all have to be sort of like the inventors of our own future. It, mm-hmm. it, it hasn't it doesn't exist because we haven't created it. And you can't always expect someone else to create it for you. You can just present who you are in the best possible light, which was which is what you were always able to do. Yeah, and of course, our teaching, where I met Jim Evering in church, is called Science of Mind. It's not a religion. It's a teaching. And the tenet is, the main tenet is, your mind creates your experience. Just like visualizing. If you're going to ski down a hill, if you're going to play in golf, you visualize your shots. And um, the point is, believe it. You have to believe it. If you're going for a job, you don't worry about, oh, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too that. You just believe it and you go in with the, they're lucky to have me. Absolutely. You know? And not just that in, in an arrogant kind of way, but but that you're an asset and that, and it, like, it, even in friendships, you know, you think, oh, I need a friend, I need a friend. Well, someone needs you as their friend. Someone mm. else needs you. It's, 
we're all in a collaboration. Life is a collaboration. Yes. Someone well, needs you. It's a great point. And I've said this to her personally, and I believe it. I think one of her most beautiful attributes is this, something that I've learned over the 30 years that I've known her, and that is once you are Kelly's friend, you are her friend, and you will always be. And nobody gives you more love and support than Kelly as your friend. It's a gift. And now we live in the same building, and there is love for everybody. Oh, there's building. a sitcom there. Yeah, you guys oh, are yeah. going to find some free ski trips. I just know it. <laughs> 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 All right, Fritzy, who are we helping help? Okay, this is a nonprofit. We're, every week we're supporting a new nonprofit. This week is Shelter Partnership. This is an organization that is on the forefront of fighting homelessness in Los Angeles. They operate the S. Mark Taper Foundation Resource Bank, which solicits large scale donations donations of merchandise like clothing and toiletries and non-perishable goods and it delivers those products to people and agencies that serve the homeless like homeless shelters and we give them the goods for free we provide technical assistance to community-based organizations in other words we help these agencies receive more than a billion dollars in federal funds we conduct research and publish analytical studies to inform public policy about homelessness we promote public education about the homeless crisis there is no bigger quality of life issue in Southern California right now than the homeless crisis. Here is a tangible way you can be part of the solution. Learn more. Make a donation at shelterpartnership.org. Wow. I put my stamp of approval on that. No, that was really well done, Fritz. Good. And I'm going to read our closing credits. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is called Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes just loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show, please give us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts using words like illuminating and magnificent. <laughs> and talk about us kindly, if you would be so kind, on your social media. Take a photo of yourself listening to us, post it, and we will give you a shout out on the show. You can sign up for our saucy rag of a newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our wonderful guests guest, the glorious Kelly Lang. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, Garrett Arch, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I'm Louise Palanker, here with Fritz Coleman and Kelly Lang. Be well and wise, and we will see you along the media path.